Hello, and welcome to Polar Bears International Tundra Connections. My name is Alisa McCall, and I'm the Director of Conservation Outreach and a Staff Scientist at EPS International. We are so glad that you could join us today. Across the globe, this is a uniquely challenging time, but we are inspired by the ways people are coming together and caring for one another right now, and we want to do our little bit to support you. So that we usually offer our our Tundra series in the fall from the shores of Hudson Bay live on Buggy One. Things look a little bit different this year, but we are still going to be mixing in live polar bear action throughout this broadcast. What you're seeing right now on your screen is live polar bears outside of Churchill, Manitoba. They have had great action all morning. There's moms and cubs, um, adult males, so we're going to be mixing them in the whole time. Um, Though this looks a little bit different right now, we are being joined by people all over the world, so we're so excited to talk to you. The content today is catered to students, but we think anyone can join and get something out of what we're seeing today. Right now you're looking at a mom and cub, very cool. And um, we are so excited to reconnect with the Microsoft education team and share our love for the Arctic with all of you. We've got some incredible experts with us who will introduce themselves in just a moment to share their knowledge and stories with you. And we also hope to answer your questions live. So during the broadcast, you can submit your questions or answers for our panelists in your chat window. Wherever you're watching this from, you should see a chat window there. Uh, we've got a team of moderators that are sending your questions to me, so I can't wait to read them. You can also email us at questions at pbears.org. That's questions at pbears.org. But we do encourage you to take advantage of that chat window. So today we are talking all about how polar bears are perfectly suited for a life on the Arctic sea ice. We are really excited to talk to you about polar bear adaptations because they are so fascinating. They are one of the coolest animals and one of the coolest habitats on Earth. We think so anyway. So we're going to chat for about 40 to 45 minutes, maybe a little bit longer today, depending on how many questions we get. So you can plan for that time. And to start by introducing our panelists. So again, I'm Elisa, but we've got two fantastic panelists today. So uh, Tia, do you mind introducing yourself first? Tell us a little bit about you and where you're from. Sure. So my name is Tia. I am joining you from Denmark right now. It is early evening, so that's why it's a little bit dark here. I'm a staff scientist with Polar Bears International, and I do polar bear research, but I also do a lot of outreach, like what we're doing right now. Thank you. Perfect. And we have, hi, Ron, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background? Hey guys, uh, yeah, so my name is Ron Toganoff. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, and I've been studying polar bears for, I believe six years now from my masters. And my focus is looking at their foraging behavior and how they try to find seals out in the vast uh, Arctic uh, sea ice. Much. Yeah, panelists today have some great expertise. And what we're seeing right now is, again, live polar bear action. You see a mom with a cub watching two probably males uh, spar or play fight with each other. Uh, so while you watch this, I'm going to tell you a little bit about adaptation. So first of all, what is an adaptation? An adaptation is the physical or behavioral characteristic of an organism that helps it better survive environment. So every animal have a certain set of adaptations to live where it does, even humans, uh, but polar bears again have a cool set of adaptations. And we have a little video that we'd like to start this broadcast with. We're going to show that to you now, and then we're going to talk more in depth about some of the things you see. And don't forget to send us your questions in your chat window. Polar bears live across the Arctic in some of the coldest places on the planet. They walk across the Arctic sea ice looking for their main prey, seals. And they have some traits that help them do this and survive in this crazy cold environment. 
Polar bears have very thick fur that helps keep them warm. In fact, they have two layers of fur. They have a thick, fuzzy, downy layer right next to their skin, which would be like us wearing a woolly sweater. And then they have a layer of guard hairs, longer hairs over top. It's kind of like their raincoat. And these two layers of fur help keep them warm even when it's minus 40 degrees. Polar bear hair is clear and hollow. It just looks white to our eyes. And the hollowness helps trap warm air against their bodies. Polar bear skin is black. We don't really know why, but we think it might help them absorb heat. Polar bears have an amazing sense of smell. Their nose has so much surface area to pick up scents in the air. They can smell prey over a kilometer away when the wind is right. Polar bears have huge paws. They can be the size of dinner plates. The big paws help spread out the polar bear's weight on the sea ice so they can walk along really thin ice if they have to. Polar bear feet can also get smelly. When females are ready to mate, they send out signals through smelly footprints on the sea ice. And a male polar bear who picks up the scent will follow a female, sometimes for days on end. Polar bear paws are also kind of sticky. They have bumps or papillae on the bottom of their feet that help grip the ice as they're walking, kind of like your winter tires. They also have fur on their feet to help keep them warm and really sharp claws that help give them traction on the ice so they don't slip. Polar bear claws are thick and sharp. Their claws help them pull out slippery seals from underneath the water up onto the sea ice. Polar bears also have very big heads with really sharp teeth that helps them hunt their prey seals. You can see they've got big canines at the front and then they've got very sharp back molars that help them shear blubber and fat off of their prey. The diastema or the gap between the front sharp canines and the back molars is perfect for helping polar bears grab a seal out of the water and pull it out onto the sea ice. You can see that all of these adaptations oh, make perfect. a polar bear perfectly suited to live in the Arctic. They need sea ice to travel, hunt, find mates, and sometimes to den. Please join us in taking action to help conserve polar bears and the sea ice they depend on. Thanks for showing that video. We have a great team behind the scenes right now. We've got BJ, Katie, Marisa, Kayla, Emma, all sorts of staff helping us uh, mix this and get your questions coming in to us. So thanks to that behind the scenes team right now. Again, we're back on the polar bear cam uh, so you can watch this mom and cub and these other polar bears hang out while we chat to you. I wanna give a quick shout out to some countries that are joining us today. So we have Canadians and Americans tuning in, but we also have viewers from Bahrain, uh, China, Czech Republic, India, Thank you so much for watching today. We're so excited that we can share polar bears with you and see what's happening live outside of Churchill, Manitoba right now. Uh, so I wanna circle back now to some adaptations. Uh, we already have lots of questions coming in and we are gonna start answering them in just a moment. But first I wanna start with mentioning that polar bears are actually mammals. So what we are seeing right now are polar bears on land, but this is just temporary. These polar bears in Churchill, they're waiting for the sea ice on Hudson Bay to refreeze. And as soon as that sea ice is back, the polar bears are going to leave, go out on the sea ice and hunt their main prey seals right only on land because there is no sea ice and they've been waiting patiently for months. And so that's why we're seeing them hang out uh, and do some funny things for us to watch. So Tia, I was hoping to ask you, where do polar bears normally live around the world? Could you tell our viewers where we find polar bears? Right, so polar bears are found in the high Arctic. Uh, the bears that we see on camera right now, they're on land because there is no ice for them to be on, like you just said, but if polar bears could choose, they would be on the Arctic sea ice year round. Um, yeah, this is where they find their this is where they find their mates. This is where they have their young in most places. So yeah, really for polar bears, it's all about the high Arctic and especially the high Arctic sea ice. Perfect. And Ron, we've got already a few questions about what do polar bears eat. Yeah, so polar bears' main source of food is actually seals that they hunt over the sea ice. There are several different species that they eat. 
The one that they hunt most frequently are the rink seals. And rink seals maintain what, uh, there's a picture of one. They like to hang out at these breathing holes that they maintain year round, or not year round, but like when there's sea ice, um, that they come out to breathe. So these are the main seals that they eat. They also eat uh, bearded seals. Now bearded seals, they don't have breathing holes that they maintain, but instead they like to find pack ice and come out over the edge um, and hang out at the surface there. And polar bears, those are the main food that they eat during winter time. In some areas, they uh, also eat uh, belugas. And sometimes belugas get trapped in sea ice where a lot of sea ice freezes and there's a small uh, gap that uh, is maintained and the beluga sometimes get trapped there. It's called entrapment. And polar bears sometimes exploit this. During the summertime when they're on land, they might eat grasses uh, and seaweed and bird eggs, uh, but this isn't their main uh, diet. And you can see they're really eager to get out on the sea ice whenever they have the opportunity, which is why they're here and not still hanging out inland. Right, thank you, Ron. And we should say that the reason that polar bears are so focused on uh, eating these seals and potentially is because of blubber. Polar bears are the biggest bear species that we find on the earth. Oh, there's that mom. She's chasing that and doesn't want them to get too close to her cub. Good job, mama. Uh, so polar bears need the blubber because it has so many calories. You don't get to be the biggest bear on earth unless you have a lot of food to eat. Uh, polar bears are also the most carnivorous. So they, even though we're seeing them on land right now, they can't make a living long term on land. They really rely on this blubber that they find uh, by hunting on the sea ice. There's I don't think any food in the world compares to how calorically dense blubber is. I mean, there's so much energy in it. Uh, polar bears can get fat and like to uh, thrive out on the sea ice by eating their blubber. I'm sorry, this polar bear cam is just fantastic to watch this right now. So, so cool that you guys get to see this with us. Loving it. Okay, let's answer a few questions really quick here. Uh, so how do polar bears get warm? Well, you know, that's the perfect question because that was our next topic. Let's talk about polar bear fur for a second. Uh, Tia, can we pass that one over to you? Could you tell our viewers a little bit about how polar bear fur keeps them warm in the cold, cold Arctic? Sure. Yeah, polar bear fur is awesome. Uh, so it consists of two different layers. Here you can see the really long hairs. They're like, we call them guard hairs. And they're kind of like the windbreaker or the rain jacket that you could put on top. And then underneath, which is a little bit harder to see here, there are these woolen hairs, like this furry undercoat. And that's like the warm sweater that you would have underneath that windbreaker or that rain jacket. And together, you know, one is the guard hair is almost twice as long as the woolen fur, just to protect it a little bit. Uh, and together, these two are just amazing at keeping the bears warm, even in the darkest night of, you know, the coldest, darkest night that you can find in the high Arctic. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's also, it's not completely hollow, but almost. And so this is why polar bears look the way they do. Sometimes they look a little bit yellow, uh, you know, especially if it's right before they molt, their yearly molt. Um, but, you know, they're mostly this vanilla ice cream color or cream color, you could call it. I like that description of polar bear for, for sure. Thank you so much. Uh, students at home, if you want to see how warm you can get like a polar bear, how many layers can you add on? Maybe you live in an area that has snow. I know I do right now. How many layers do you need to stay warm in a cold, cold environment? It's pretty neat that polar bears only have two layers. If they stay so warm. Okay, we also have a few questions about polar bear noses, which is very appropriate. Next topic. Um, so first of all, how long can they hold their breath? Well, the longest recorded instance of a polar bear was when it was diving underwater for food, which we don't see all the time. We know that that polar bear held its breath for three minutes and 10 seconds, which is pretty great. I can't hold my breath for anywhere near that. But I'd like to pass this one over to Ron. Ron, could you tell our viewers a little bit about how polar bears find their food on the sea ice, which is so huge? Uh, do they smell seals? How do they navigate around? How do they use their nose? Yeah, 
So if you saw from the video, the sea ice is, is an extremely vast habitat that they have to cover. Uh, from where they are to the horizon, it's, it's just sea ice. And the food that they're trying to find, it's not always easy to find because obviously the seals don't want uh, to be found. So they try to find areas uh, where they're more obscured. So during the seal pupping uh, season, when uh, they're having their young, they uh, give birth in what are called uh, these uh, subnivian layers, which are uh, their pupping layers under the sea ice. So you can't even actually see them. And the sea ice habitat is actually extremely complex. It's not always completely flat where you can see to the horizon. Uh, there's often all these pressure ridges where the sea ice comes together and it's really hard to see that far. So relying on vision is not uh, always ideal for polar bears. So they've actually developed an, an incredible sense of smell and is actually one of the strongest um, in the animal kingdom. Compared to their body size, their, uh, the part of their brain that processes scent is much bigger than you would expect compared to other animals. So here you can see a polar bear smelling. In that picture, you might have actually noticed that its mouth was slightly open. And that's because they have a, actually a little gap in their mouth that goes into their nose to help them uh, breathe or to help them detect scents. So they've developed this incredible sense of smell. And actually one thing that I've been researching uh, as part of my master's and my PhD is how they incorporate wind into their hunting strategies. So if you think seals, they're producing all kinds of odors. These odors that polar bears can smell are carried by the wind. And the question is uh, that I've been asking is, is there an ideal strategy to move relative to the wind to try to detect these odors? And as it turns out, there is. So if you think that you're a polar bear and you don't smell anything, you could either travel upwind, so in the opposite direction of wind, or you can travel downwind, or you might travel crosswind. Now, if you're traveling upwind or downwind, you're still within the same stream of air. So if you don't smell anything, you're not really learning much about your environment. But if you're traveling crosswind, uh, so perpendicular, 90 degrees to wind, then you're constantly encountering new streams of air and you're constantly learning about the environment. So that's the optimal strategy uh, to detect these seals. And that's actually exactly what we see polar bears do. For the majority of the time, while they're out on the sea ice, they're traveling crosswind. And that's, we think, to detect uh, seals. That is so fascinating that polar bears use their nose that much. But it makes sense when you're out there on the vast sea ice, um, it sure helps to have a good nose on you. Thank you so much for that. And again, that polar bear footage is live. That is happening right outside of Churchill. This is an amazing day so far. Uh, so keep asking any questions you have about that. And we're gonna take a few questions right, right now. That um, I, T, I'm gonna throw this one back to you because it's about polar bear fur. Um, it's from a third grade class in Utah. Um, is polar bear fur soft? Do they feel quite soft or is it more coarse? How do they feel? Hmm. That's a really good question. <laughs> it is. So it actually, the two kinds of hairs that I was talking about before, they feel a little bit different. So the, the guard hairs, the long ones, they're a little bit stiffer, kind of like the whiskers on a cat, if you can imagine that. And then the woolen fur is kind of like uh, maybe sheep's wool, if I would compare it to anything. So, so that's a lot softer and more curly and all of that. So, yeah, I think that's the best description. Yeah. What would you say, Elisa? Yeah. Oh, I think you're dead on. I think sometimes they feel maybe like, um, like a German Shepherd thing, like not really soft, just kind of not rough though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it depends if they're have kind of wet fur or not. But yeah, they're they're let's oh, just sure. say they're not as soft as they sometimes look. They're a little bit rougher than that. So thank you so much. We have a few questions here about the lifespan of polar bears, which is always very interesting. Uh, so male polar bears uh, can live into their early 20s or so. Females live a little longer, maybe mid 20s, maybe late 20s. Uh, male polar bears fight for real. So what you're seeing on your screen right now is sparring or play fighting. Uh, but in the spring, 
male pole for real for mates and that gets pretty nasty sometimes and they can really hurt each other uh, so the males don't tend to live quite as long as the females in the wild of course in zoos polar bears are a little more pampered they live a little longer and the oldest known polar bear uh, was Debbie Winnipeg who lived to be 42 years old which was the record that we know of right now which is pretty cool Okay, so we've got some more questions about polar bear claws and paws, which is perfect because that is the next topic. Uh, we have a question from the video that we started our broadcast with today. Um, how did we get that polar bear cast, the paw print that we used in that video? That's a good question. So researchers actually uh, took a paw print of a female polar bear, an adult female that they were working on. So when we work on polar bears in the field, we do tranquilize them. They sleep for about an hour while we take samples and weigh them and see how healthy they are. Uh, they pushed her foot into some plaster and then we're able to set that and make a bunch of molds out of it. So now we can show you uh, what, a, what a paw print looks like for an adult. Now, of course, adult males have even bigger prints than that, if you can believe it. Polar bears have huge feet. Uh, their feet can be the size of a dinner plate, and that really helps distribute their weight over the sea ice. So if you can imagine four huge paws are able to distribute a lot of weight over sea ice. So polar bears can actually walk on ice that is pretty thin. Also sea ice, because it's salty the way it freezes, it's a little, let's say, bouncier, more elastic than maybe uh, freshwater ice. So we have seen polar bears go over pretty thin ice, even big bears, which is cool. Ice that you or I might fall through. The bears can make it across, which is great. One cool thing about polar bear paws too is that they're kind of bumpy. So they have what we call papillae on their paws, little bumps. And it's like a winter tire. It gives them some traction or some tread on the ice. So you don't often see a polar bear slip. It does happen because ice is sure slippery, uh, but they are able to walk on some pretty slippery surfaces steadily. Another cool thing with our feet is that they can help polar bears communicate with each other which is pretty cool when a female is ready to mate in the spring um, she can actually release a scent out of her footprint so she gets these special smelly feet and as she walks across the sea ice uh, she's leaving the scent in her footprints and a male polar bear can find her footprints sniff them and then follow her and uh, see if they're at some point and it, it helps them find each other on the sea ice. The sea ice is this huge, huge expanse of white um, land that it's moving and it's cracking and it's breaking. It can be really hard to find anything out there. So putting down some smelly footprints really helps polar bears find each other. Okay, so let another question. This is a neat one about teeth. Tia, I'm going to throw this one to you and then Ron, I have one for you as a follow-up. Um, Tia, are polar bear teeth fused to their skulls? What a neat question. I don't think I've ever been asked that before. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Please keep the questions coming. Uh, they are not fused to their skull any more than our teeth are fused to their skull. Like there are um, nerves running inside the jawbone that also go into the teeth of us and for polar bears. Uh, but also just the gums, they actually help keep teeth in place. So if you take away the nerves and the blood vessels and you take away the gums, the teeth will fall out. Yeah. So if you had a polar bear skull, let's see if I can point like up here, this is a replica. But if you had a polar bear skull that, you know, no one had glued the teeth into their rightful place uh, and you turn it upside down, they would actually fall out. Uh, so live footage from the polar bear cam. I'm trying to count how many polar bears we see on the screen there. Uh, I think there were more than five. <laughs> Pretty neat stuff. One, three, four, five, five. You guys let us know six. how many polar bears no? you see. Six? Maybe. I'm having my eyes these days. Like, <laughs> let us know how many polar bears you're counting <laughs> and what you're seeing on your cam in that chat window there. Ron, I've got a question for you. I'd like us to circle back to talk a little bit more about what polar bears eat because really, you know, their diet is what's driving their habitat use and a lot of these adaptations are specialized with what they eat. And let's just off talk on um, this third grade class in Chicago again. Uh, do, do bears hungry do they wait for that meal? And how, just tell us their diets. Sorry, the audio was cutting out there. I didn't quite hear the question. Um, 
Um, uh, sure, yeah. So yeah. as Elisa mentioned early on, um, blubber is the most important thing for polar bears. They're really big animals and it requires a lot of energy to maintain those bodies. But also if you're a mom with cubs, you're uh, nursing uh, them and you have to produce a lot of energy rich milk to uh, feed them. In fact, if you're a mom uh, that's pregnant in the summertime, you would go into a maternity den and you would stay there and you might not feed for eight months of the year while at the same time feeding up to three uh, cubs. So that requires a lot of energy. So when polar bears are hunting um, or feeding, they need the most energy rich food and that's the blubber that Elisa talked about early on. Um, and in fact, if a, if a bear catches a seal, sometimes it might only eat the blubber and leave the meat behind. And then you might have scavenging foxes or seabirds or other hungry bears come in and eat the rest of the seal. So the blubber is the most important thing for them. And that's why out in oh, during the summertime when they're on land, uh, they're nibbling on things, but they're really just waiting to get on onto the sea ice. In recent years, we've actually been seeing them uh, going more and eating uh, garbage that humans leave behind uh, just to get as many calories as they can. Um, but regardless, they're, they're trying to get out over, over the sea ice and, and eat some blubber. So Ron, do polar bears get hungry when they haven't eaten for a while? Well, I mean, I, I'm sure they, they certainly do. But it's actually interesting because seals are really hard to find because they're so spread out and so uh, hidden and hunting them is actually kind of hard. You don't always succeed. In fact, most of the time a bear tries to catch a seal, it's not going to succeed. So often bears might go days without eating seals and that's sort of the norm uh, when they're uh, out on the sea ice. They can go, I think on average, around five days without eating between seals. And most of the feeding happens at the very end of the winter period, actually, in spring, when the seals are pupping. So for the months before that, um, and then for the entire summer, uh, they do go gaps without eating that um, certainly they, they probably feel hunger. That makes a lot of sense. Well, we have more questions coming in uh, to get to those. I also want to ask you guys, too, if you have permission, from an adult teacher, your parent, um, you can take a picture of yourself watching the polar bear cow and you could share them with us on Twitter or Facebook at Skype Classroom and at Polar Bears. And we can put that information in the chat, but we'd love to see you watching polar bears if it's okay uh, with your adult that's near you right now. So if you'd like to do that, please do. I'd like to take another question. We have one here from Amelia, six years old. Do polar bear paws get cold when they walk on the ice and snow? That's a great question because I know I need to wear thick socks and boots if I'm gonna walk on the ice and snow. But you know, polar bears actually have fur on their feet. So under their paw pads, not across the entire foot, but a good amount of their foot is covered by fur. You can kind of see it here, there you go. So they have enough fur that keeps their feet pretty cozy, even in the cold ice and snow. They kind of have built-in socks, that's pretty nice. Uh, Tia, I've got a couple questions for you. Do polar mm -hmm. bears have black skin when they are born? And how exactly does their skin and fur help them trap the warm air? Right. First question first. Polar bear cubs, yep. like a newborn polar bear cub would fit in the palm of my hand. They are tiny. They're blind or like they have their eyes closed. They only have a little bit of fur and they have pink skin. So, yeah. But then, mm -hmm. you know, they're in that den with their mom for about three months. And in that period, before they actually have to emerge into the sunlight in the Arctic spring, their skin turns black. And so that's probably partly because black is really good at collecting the heat and you know trapping the heat, if you will. Uh, but also the more pigment, the more color you have in your skin, the more you're protected against the sun's rays. And so if you're a polar bear and you're living up there in the high Arctic, 
uh, with 24 hour daylight during the spring and summer, then it's good to be protected against harmful sun rays. Um, so they have the dark skin to help them, uh, you know, keep the heat. Uh, but this, the fur also helps in that it creates this dense layer of hair, I would say, that just traps the air. So it makes the air be stand very still in between those little curly hairs, the under fur. And that just means that there's this extra of calm air that is then very warm because it doesn't get exchanged all the time. That's so interesting. Thank you. We're seeing this mom and cub walk across our stream. Uh, she is staying between the other polar bear and her cub, if you see what that mom's doing there, pretty smart stuff. Uh, we do have a question about how long polar bears are pregnant for. So polar bears mate in the spring and females have something called delayed implantation. So she actually isn't technically pregnant yet, even if she's mated successfully. The female polar bear is gonna, at least in this area, come onto land in the summer. And then if she's healthy and fat enough to sustain a pregnancy, then that zygote, that fertilized egg, then implants, and now she's technically pregnant, and she'll go into her den in the fall. So right now, pregnant females are in their den, and they're going to be giving birth probably in the next month. So we often assign our polar bear cubs with the birthday of January 1st, just to make it easy. And then again, in this area, they're going to emerge from their dens in approximately late February, early March. And then the mom's going to take her new cub or cubs out to the sea ice and teach them how to hunt next spring. So if you do that math, a pregnant female polar bear goes up to eight months without eating, which is pretty phenomenal. So talk about being hungry. I'm sure she is ready for her next meal after she gives birth and heads back out onto the sea ice. Great question. Um, Ron, question for you. How do polar bears get water? Do they drink it or do they eat ice and snow? So it's actually really interesting. Uh, they don't really do either. They definitely can't uh, drink the sea ice because it's salty and no good. Um, and the problem with eating uh, salt or eating um, snow is that it takes a lot of energy to heat up that snow and melt it and turn it into water. So that's not a really good strategy when polar bears are trying to uh, maintain as much energy as possible. So what they most of their water actually comes from the blubber that they eat. They actually have, uh, they metabolize it, so they work it within their bodies using uh, chemistry, and they extract water uh, molecules from fat. So they actually sort of make their own water from the fat that they eat. What a cool thing to do. Wow, thank you for that, Ron. Okay, uh, well, here, I've got another question for you quickly about diets then. How many seals do they eat a day? Are they getting multiple seals a day or is it a bit more spread out? Yeah, so it's quite hard to catch a seal. And I think a polar bear would eat as many seals as it can. If it could eat 10 seals a day, it would eat 10 seals a day until it couldn't move. Um, but in reality, because it's so hard to catch seals, they might go several days between um, between uh, eating one seal or another seal. Um, but of course, if they uh, are successful, they might have, um, you know, multiple seals a day if, if they can, or even scavenge on some food left behind by a previous bear. Cool. We have a question here about how strong is polar bear bite force? Pretty strong. Uh, polar bears do have a very strong bite, but one interesting thing about their bite is that it's not quite as strong as, as the brown sleeve bear, because again, it comes back to diet and adaptations. If you think about the polar bear's main source of food, that blubber, pretty squishy. You don't need a huge, strong jaw to bite blubber, uh, but the brown bear eats a lot of harder things, a lot more vegetation, a lot more meat, um, and so they have a bit of a stronger bite. But, you know, polar bears still bite pretty strong, so we don't want to get on that end of a polar bear. We, it, When we're working in the field, we're always very, very safe to give the polar bears their space, and when you see them even play fighting there, um, sometimes what polar bears do is they'll bite each other's necks and kind of twist. I think if you've ever seen dogs play, something pretty similar, and though it even when they're doing it for fun, it sure looks like it hurts. So they do bite pretty 
Strong. Oh, we've got a great question. What's that car? Okay, so for those of you watching this live cam right now, you might have seen a tundra buggy in the background. And that's actually uh, one of our live cams is mounted on a tundra buggy. So we sometimes call them polar bear monster trucks, but this is the Frontiers North Adventure Buggy One. And usually we are doing these sessions live from inside that buggy. It's got bunk beds and a like, like mini kitchen and a fireplace and a toilet. It's got everything. Everything is a media studio on this little buggy. It's pretty amazing. And there's trails out on this tundra that we stay on. And that's what allows us to get close to these bears safely. Uh, so we've got cameras mounted out there that are live streaming this. And tourists can actually go out on these buggies as well and go view the polar bears. Of course, this year, there are not many tourists up there. Uh, but there's still a couple buggies out watching the bears. And so you might see one of those on your screen. But most of the polar bears and the other wildlife that are out there enjoying this lovely day out on the tundra. So thank you for that question. Okay, we've got, this is a good segue into these next questions here. A few questions about whether... The polar bear has any predators. Tia, I was wondering, could you answer, does the polar bear have any predators in place in the food chain? Well, the primary predator would be humans. Um, so in some areas, uh, there is a sustainable hunt, uh, a certain number of bears that local uh, people are allowed to take every year. So yeah, humans also, you know, big adult male polar bears may actually try and kill and eat cubs if they come across a mom with young cubs. Um, but other than that, they're pretty much, you know, they're the top predator. They're the they're the boss of the high Arctic. Yeah. Absolutely. We. I'm hoping. Well, I don't want to get away from this. Maybe I'll just talk about it for a minute, and then we'll show you an animation of it later. Polar bears are, uh, we consider them to be at the top of the arc web, and they're even called an umbrella species or a keystone species because they are so important in the Arctic. Uh, living up on this Arctic sea ice, they're not the only animal in the Arctic, of course, that depends on Arctic sea ice. There's a whole food web that revolves around the sea ice in the Arctic. So this is to the ocean. Soil is to the forest. The way that sea ice freezes because it's salty, it freezes with all these little channels and ridges inside of it. And algae can actually grow up inside the sea ice. And this algae is like the plants. And it's the little microscopic creatures like copepods and diatoms, which feed the fish, which feed the seals, which feed the polar bears. And of course, there are whales and there are people and there are all sorts of amazing animals that live throughout the Arctic that really rely on Arctic sea ice. And so I was hoping that we could share a little video here too, uh, well, as well about what's happening to Arctic sea ice and why we're concerned about the future of the polar bear in this Arctic ecoregion. Uh, so we'll get to pull up our, our next little video. Climate change is already affecting some populations of polar bears. Since we get most of our energy from fossil fuels, we are producing huge amounts of carbon dioxide. You see, regular amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere act like a blanket around the Earth, trapping heat and keeping our planet at a stable temperature. However, when we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas for energy, we pump rampant amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This buildup thickens the blanket, trapping too much heat, disrupting the climate, and melting Arctic sea ice. I hope that explained a little more about why we uh, care about protecting polar bears and their Arctic sea ice home and what's going on. Uh, the great thing about knowing what the problem is and what's causing it is that we know what the solutions are. And that's a really great thing uh, because that means that we can take action and we can all work together to help protect the future of polar bears and ourselves. So we think we do have a responsibility to protect polar bears and there's lots of things that we can all do. But the important thing to remember is that we can work together. This is not an individual problem, but we can work together in our neighborhoods uh, and with our family and friends and schools and communities and towns and states or provinces to make these changes. And the important thing is that we need to move away from burning fossil fuels and over to more renewable energy sources like solar and wind. So let's look for ways to use more energy from nature in our neighborhoods. Uh, you can ask your teachers and parents, give them homework. What kind of energy is being used to heat and cool your school and your home? 
Uh, these adults can learn about different sources of energy like wind, water, or solar that they can maybe tap into in their communities. So many families are making choices around them uh, to change where their energy is coming from. And these are all steps that help protect that Arctic sea ice habitat, that entire ecosystem that protects these polar bears, that helps make sure that they get on the ice soon to go hunt seals, that they're adapted to hunt. And this is the right thing to do for polar bears, the planet, and for ourselves, because we all want um, a clean, healthy, stable future, and we all want to see polar bears into the future. So we talked a lot about adaptations today. So adaptations are these characteristics that allow an animal to live where it does. And with polar bears living on sea ice, they are so well adapted to it from their noses, to their paws, to their claws, uh, to their teeth, to their diet, to their fur. Everything about polar bears just makes them so well suited to live in the Arctic. They truly are an Arctic animal. So we are just going to take a couple more quick questions and then we're going to wrap up. And again, thank you so, so much for joining us today and watching these live polar bears. It's been so fun. So let's just take a couple more questions before we say goodbye, because you guys have been asking just amazing questions. Oh, we've got a nice one here. How do polar bear cubs know where to go once they are born? Tia, can I give that one to you? How do polar bear cubs know where they're going when they're born? where they're going oh i think so you mean when they're really tiny you know when they they're only a handful of bear uh, the mama bear even though she is enormous compared to these tiny newborn cubs she is gentle with them and she really pays attention to where they are so she doesn't lie on them or step on them uh, and she also actually helps them so she will help them up um so that they can nurse with her and then you know eventually they grow and then they can also just find wherever they want to go they can go themselves yeah polar bear moms really are amazing cubs stay with their mom about two and a half years uh, and the moms protect them from any threats, teach them how to walk on sea ice, teach them how to hunt and follow their noses, and just do everything to teach these little bears how to be big polar bears out on the Arctic sea ice. It's pretty cool to be watching all these moms and cubs on the polar bear cam as well. So we've got one more question, and I'll offer it to you. Do polar bears or orcas? Do polar bears live near orcas or killer whales? Oh, near killer whales. So, uh, so killer whales, they actually are not ideally suited for the Arctic. And that's because they need to come up for air. Um, and with their big dorsal fin, so that's the fin on their back that we see come out of the water when they breathe, that would get in the way uh, when they're trying to come out for, uh, to breathe where there's sea ice. So actually when the sea ice comes in, uh, uh, freezes up over the Arctic, the killer whales, they are nowhere near to be found. But as the sea ice uh, melts during springtime and going into the summer, uh, orcas do actually go further and further north and sort of follow it to try to feed on some of the food that's there. Primarily, actually, narwhal are some of their favorite. So at the same time as the sea ice melts, polar bears in, are forced to come onto land. So by the time orcas come, uh, most of the polar bears are on land. Now, uh, there might be some period of time when they overlap because polar bears do like to stay on the sea ice as long as possible to feed the seals. But there doesn't appear too much overlap um, where they're together at the same time. Uh, that said, uh, when the sea ice does melt, there are a lot of polar bears swimming back to shore and there might be some orcas um, around near those times in some areas, but it's not too common. And that's another great example of adaptations uh, helping determine where we might find an animal. So polar bears, I think we convinced you today are adapted for a life in the Arctic. Thank you again so much for your questions. If we didn't get to them live, we'll do our best to answer them now through our moderator team or through our questions at pbears.org account. But please do feel free to email us questions anytime at Polar Bears International. We always are happy to answer your questions about anything you're seeing. And please also do keep watching the Polar Bear Cam. It will be live for a few more weeks.
at least. And we'll be bringing you all sorts of fantastic footage of polar bears. And there's been other animals on there too, including some foxes and a wolverine. So you never know what you might see out on the tundra there. Um, so thank you, Ron. Thank you, Tia, for joining me today and helping answer these questions and talk about Arctic adaptations. It was fantastic. And please also um, don't forget, if you took a picture of yourself watching this broadcast today with an adult's permission, put it on Facebook or Twitter and tag at Skype Classroom or at ours. We'd love to see it if that's okay with your adult. And also stay tuned for more uh, events live from Churchill all week. So we have more Tundra Connections webcast next week. We've got live chats as well on the cam. You can see the schedule on the polarbearsinternational.org webpage. Also, this is Polar Bear Week. So there's all sorts of cool events happening this week through Polar Bears International and explore.org who helps us run the polar bear cam. So please do check those out. Lots of great stuff going on and lots of ways you can help polar bears. And we're going to wrap up this whole session with another fantastic video about ways you can help polar bears and ways you can get involved. Uh, so if you are a teacher or a student who's interested in more materials, we do have lots of learning materials available as well on the polarbearsinternational.org website, but also on Flipgrid. So please do check out our Flipgrid resources. We've got new lessons and more will be added throughout the year on a continual basis. So Thank you again to Microsoft Skype in the classroom for helping make this happen today, to explore.org for that amazing polar bear cam video today. And please do keep watching that. And thank you for your curiosity and for tuning in and for your interest in polar bears and in what we had to say today. Uh, we can't thank you enough for being interested and we can't thank you enough for caring about polar bears. And thanks again to our panelists. And we are now going to wrap up with this video and maybe we'll see you again in the future. Bye. Future generations of people and polar bears depend on the decisions and plans that we make today. The key to getting the climate back to functioning the way it should and to preserving a future for polar bears across the Arctic is to move away from using fossil fuels for energy altogether. The most important thing we can do is vote with the climate in mind to let our leaders know we support a swift transition to renewable energy sources. In the meantime, we can directly participate in and learn more about our local and regional renewable energy options. We can all make a difference outside our own households by influencing where our energy comes from. We hope you leave here feeling inspired and return home to leverage your voice and your influence. Because together, we can make sure that polar bears roam the Arctic sea ice for generations to come.